Uh, if you can turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 chapter, uh, the 15th chapter of the 33rd verse. Getting a little tongue-tied, church. And when you get there, please say amen. All right. 15 verse 33. I'll be all there. All right, very short verse, but we've got a lot to cover today, so I won't be long in the scripture, in this scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Is everyone there? All right. And it reads, do not be what? Deceived. Some say misled. That's good. Bad company corrupts good character. Some versions say ruin good morals. Let's read that again. Do not be deceived. Bad company what? Ruins good character. The title of my message today is called Train Up by Influencing Your Child's Relationships. Train Up by Influencing Your Child's Relationships. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you, God, for your, for your word, Father. Your word is true. God, I stand before you as a vessel. God, I, um, I don't want to speak today, Father. I want you to speak. So, Father God, allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you in your sight, Father. I pray, God, that you speak through your vessel today. Prepare the hearts of your people so they may receive the word and that we may be here, uh, not just hearers of your word, but be doers of your word. So, God, we bless your name. Have your way through this message. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You all may be seated in the name of the Lord. Train up by influencing your child's relationships. Church, relationships will make you or break you. By who you surround yourself with, by who you choose to connect with, they will either make your life or break your life. Some of you may have had some bad relationships. You may have been with some friends, maybe been with some family, or maybe even entered in some marital agreements with some bad people. But one extreme that we can take as people of God is to isolate ourselves from relationships because we need relationships. We need people. God did not design us to live alone. That's why I'm so glad we are doing life groups. We have these groups once a week. You need to be connected in a life group because God did not design for you to live life by yourself. And people will push you to a point Will you say, I no longer need you. I no longer want you. And us as parents, we have experienced the hurt of relationships. And so what we'll try to do is shield our children from forming relationships instead of teaching them who to choose and who not to choose. One extreme as a parent is we can lock our kids in the house and say, you ain't going to play with nobody. Right? I'm going to homeschool you. Matter of fact, you can't even go to the bathroom by yourself. I won't be in the bathroom with you, child. But your child must understand how to choose the right friends, how to choose the right people. And also, people of God, I don't know where you are in your life. You, adults, need to know who you need to be with. God did not call you to be with everyone. Amen? But kids at this age are so young and they're, they're so... Uh, Laughing at my son, Jackson... Uh, we take him now to football practice with my oldest son, Jaden, and he met this kid for one practice. And I said, Jaden, uh, Jackson, who was that? He said, Dad, that's my best friend. I said, Jackson, who's five, you just met him. How is he your best friend? Uh, and so our children, what they show me as, as a fact, parents, is that our children need guidance to find out what a friend is and what a friend isn't. As they go to school, they're going to be around people, right? They have 19 kids in their class. Some uh, schools have thousands of people in their class. And we as parents, we need to understand who are they connected with. Because by the, by the, the scripture is true, the scripture is true, that bad company corrupts good morals. You could be doing all you're doing in the house, but if you don't know who your kids are talking to, that will influ that they, they will influence the, the good teaching that you have taught them out of them. Okay? So the scripture is saying, don't be deceived. The people in the church of Corinth were being deceived. 
they were starting to believe that Jesus did not resurrect from the dead. Right. So in this chapter, Paul is exclaiming to the people, said, listen, whoever you are talking to, stop talking to them because they are talking your faith out of you. You being taught, you're in church, you're receiving the word, but the people you are surrounding yourself, they have your ear, it's going into your heart. Now all of a sudden you are being deceived. So listen here, church. Relationships matter. Who you surround yourself with matters. Who your child surrounds himself with matters. We're going to look at some stories in the Bible of some people who made some bad decisions with relationships and some people who made some good, uh, decisions, good decisions with relationships. Sorry, getting tongue-tied. We're going to talk first about Samson. If you're going to all turn with me to Judges chapter 14, we're going to stick in verse 3. But I'm going to give you some, some pre-story to Samson. So Samson was destined, right? Ever since before he was born, an angel appeared to his mother and father and said, listen, this child is called to be special. So you cannot cut his hair. You should not be drinking wine. There were certain criteria because God had called Samson to be great. God had called Samson to be a, a, a leader to the people of Israel. But here, as we study, in, 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 uh, if you look at verse uh, uh, chapter 13, you don't have to go there. But the people of Israel, because of their sin, have been given over to the Philistine army. Bible says they were under captivity for 40 years, 40 long years under captivity because of their sin. And so Samson was not a Philistine. He was part of the people of Israel. But understand this as we read the text. Although Samson had good strength, God had given him strength. God had given him ability. God had given him, given him good character. God had given them all these tools. Samson had a weakness. Samson had a weakness. And as we read deeper into the text, Samson loved women. Not just any type of women. Samson had a type. You all know y'all got a type, amen? Samson loved not the people of his own culture. Samson loved them Philistine women. I don't know if it was the hair. I don't know if it was the, the, the skin tone or whether he liked yellow bone or whatever he likked. Amen? Coke bottle. What, I, I don't know what all Samson's criteria was, but after reading in the text, I find out that he loved Philistine women. And when his parents found out, when Samson brought a woman to his mother and father to say, listen, check her out, Dad, his parents said, son, there's some good women in our own culture that you can choose. And listen here, church. I don't know if you, what, what your dating past is. Listen to your parents, okay? They have some wisdom when you are choosing your mate. But Samson's parents said, listen, don't go on that path, right? If you look in verse, uh, verse 3, but his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among of all our, our people that you must go to take for your wife from the un uncircumcised cir 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 Philistines? So understand this. I want us to get this. Because Samson's mother and father, back then, it was not about color. It was not dating somebody that was the same skin tone as you. Understand how they, she calls them the uncircumcised Philistines. What his mother and, and father were talking about is, is there someone within our own culture that believes what we believe, that knows the God that we know, okay? Is there someone that serves our God and serves our Lord that has our values that you can hook up with? Because I know they look good. I know she's fine, Samson. But we want to judge by character, not by the outward appearance, amen? But look what Samson says. Samson was hard-headed, y'all, like a lot of us, amen? Although his parents told them, don't talk to that woman, Samson said in verse 3, uh, said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. 
Get her for me because she is right in my eyes. His words that he says back to his mother are so indicative to his thought pattern. Because he said they are right in my eyes, not God's eyes. Church, how many decisions have we made because something was right in our eyes, not God's eyes? Church, how many decisions, how many purchases, how many relationships have we endowed in because that person was right in my eyes, not God's eyes? Yeah, you thought he was cute. You thought he had a six pack. He had all the external criteria and eyes deceive you into going with that fool, knowing he was not right for you. And all of a sudden he was right in your eyes and not God's eyes. Yes, you married your type. You thought he was your type. He was tall, dark, and handsome. But you didn't realize that the darkness was a sign of his heart. He was jacked up. He was a sucker. He was, okay, let me stop. (laughs) Pastor, help me out. Church, am I touching, t- talking to some of y'all today? Listen, you married some, you were in some relationship with some, some bad brothers or some bad sisters. Yes, yeah, she took selfies, but she was all about herself. And then you realize that self cost a lot. So now you are, you can't sleep at night because you're trying to please this woman who was all about herself and nothing about you. She's right in God's, in, in my eyes, but not right in God's eyes. So Samson, even though he was destined, even though he was called by God to live a called life, he did not gird his relationships. And he ended up getting hooked up with a Philistine woman who was no good for him. As you're reading the text, it wasn't this woman he had married that jacked him up. He then engages in relationships with prostitutes and then all of a sudden with Delilah. Church, let me catch this point real quick. Don't play with the enemy. The Philistines were the enemy. The people of Israel was God's people. But all of a sudden, he's dibbling and dabbling with the enemy. Church, the enemy studies you just like, uh, better than anyone else. The Bible says that he seeps around seeking whom he may devour. He knows your type. He knows your weakness. And you, if you think you don't have something that can make you fall, I want you to think again. Because Samson ended up meeting a Delilah and getting hooked up with a bad relationship. We know the story, church, that... um, he has some pillow talk. And Delilah, I don't know what she did to him, but he started telling everything. Right? And all of a sudden told a secret to his great strength. Next thing you know, uh, she cut, uh, he cut, they cut, she cut all his hair off. He lost his strength. And the story of Samson is such a sad, a sad story. But it was all because of his poor relationships. He made a bad decision with his relationships. Parents, it's the same with you with your kids, Right? We need to make sure they are surrounded by good people. As I close with the story with Samson, one thing I noticed about Samson, his strength was his weakness also. Because here he is, he had an army to to defeat people, but here he is by himself defeating all these people by himself. I don't read in the text where Samson surrounded himself by friends, by godly people. Because he had this capability to do things by himself, he never ever reached out to people to develop relationships with. So let's don't be like Samson, y'all. Don't be like Samson. But there is a person I want you to be like. I want you to be like Daniel. We studied Daniel. Daniel, as we read in the text, and most people don't realize that when, when they said no to the king, These boys were only teenagers. These boys were only teenagers. And so when we read into the text and realize how they were intellectual, how they were smart, and how they were able to have character, and how they were able to have courage, the question I, I must ask myself is where did these boys learn this? Back then, they didn't have sci fair ISD. Back then, they didn't have Tomball School District. But they did have the home. These boys were taught in their home how to behave and who to hang around and how to say no. But as we look at Daniel, okay, 
we understand that Daniel had a squad. Daniel had a team. He had people in his life with him to help him get through life. And although God called him to be a leader, he wouldn't have gotten to that point in his life if he didn't have people surrounded by him. You know, the text tells us he had uh, a, a brother by the name of Shadrach and he had a brother by the name of Meshach and he had a bad Negro next to him. Right. Shadrach. <laughs> no, OK, let me stop there. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were his friends. And it was by his relationships that gave him the ability to have courage. Is this helping somebody? All right. Understand this is the same situation. God had given the people over to captivity, right? They're under Babylonian captivity at this time. God calls Daniel. Daniel surrounds himself by a uh, by family, Okay. But under, as you read the story in Daniel 1, uh, they made a decision together that they were not going to eat the king's meat, right? And it's something about being around someone and being able to fast together, okay? They said, I, I guarantee, the Bible doesn't show all their conversations, but I guarantee it, like, man, you be good, Doc. It's day 39. I know you want some steak, but be good, Doc. I know you're going keto on us. I know you're going keto, but we don't want to go cheeto, okay? We want to stay keto. But he had some friends to encourage him. Right. But they all said no to the king together. They were also not only this, they were thrown into the fire together. Right. We know that when they did not bow down to the king's statue, they were thrown into the furnace and they were in some mess together. Right. They were in the fire, in a trial together. The Bible says that they were praying in the furnace together. Parents, relationships matter. You can either raise a child that has a relational attitude like Samson or have a child that has a relational attitude like Daniel. Church, as we go to my first point, I first want you to make sure your child knows who they are. We all know the story of the ugly duckling, right? And this duckling from birth was different. All the other ducklings were a different color. And they had this one duckling that was ugly. But the funny thing is that the only person who didn't think the, ugly, the duckling was ugly was his mama. Your mama going to love you with your ugly. No, None of y'all are ugly. Y'all are all beautiful. Pass the jokes around. I have to tell y'all I joke around. Is this okay if I joke around with y'all? Yeah. Okay, all right. You know, pastor likes, likes to have fun. But there was this one duckling that was, didn't look like everyone else. It was different. But the mother, as you see through the story, always loved the duckling and always reminded the duckling of what it was and what it, what it could become. At the end of the story, we know the duckling became a swan. And it looked at his, his face in the water and saw how beautiful it was. Church, this is what we have to do with our kids. As they go to school and they may feel different, as they, as they may feel like they are uh, a sore thumb or may feel like God is not with them at school, we need to be at home reinforcing in them who God has called them to be. Because anytime you lack definition of who you are, someone else will define it for you. When you don't know who you are in Christ, when no one tells you you love you, you will accept someone who says they love you because you have no true definition of who loves you. Come on, am I helping somebody? Listen, you know the relationship you have been in. You didn't love yourself first. You didn't know who you were in Christ. And you end up hooking up with someone who defined what love is for you. And then you found out over time that that ain't love. I don't know what it is, but I don't want it. So in the home church, we've got to define for our kids who they are in Christ, that they are a child of God, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. That no matter what someone calls you, God has called you. So I found myself, church, as, at, at school, no matter how my child behaves, when they come home reminding them of who they are. 
When someone talks about you, child, remind who you are. Okay? Because it's going to change. In, in elementary school, it's a little tougher. Middle school, high school, they get savage in high school, doc. High school's a whole other level. Clicks and talking about this and talking about your mama. You know, when you were elementary, mama's, mama jokes were cool in elementary. You need all your mama this. When you get to high school, you're ready to fight somebody over your mama, you know. <laughs> but as you get older, guys, you have to deal with this. But so, so we need to remind ourselves, uh, our kids, of who they are consistently. You're a child of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. The scripture says this about you. The word of God says this about you. Okay? Next point. Parents, influence your child's relationships and friendships. Most of us as parents, we sometimes have this gut feeling that let them be free. Let, let, let him just live, choose whoever. He likes little Junior. He, he like, they, they, like, they like to play the game together. Let them hang out. And your son come home sad, or your daughter, oh, I can't hang with you. No. Parents, you need to know who your child is hanging with. Don't assume. You need to ask questions of who your child is hanging with. Because the scripture is true. Bad company corrupts good character. So this is a healthy conversation in school. Who are your friends? It don't have to be pointing fingers. Tell me about your friends. Okay? Whose house are you going over with? Now we can't do sleepovers yet. No, I ain't ready for sleepovers yet. Okay? <laughs> ever. She said ever. <laughs> ever, ever. Because <laughs> bad company corrupts good character. I always found myself, you know, when I was, uh, when Pastor, I was saved, but I kind of backslid a little bit when I was in college. I ain't got an amen the whole message, but she got an amen in college. <laughs> but it was always when I was with the wrong people. It was when I was doing the, 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 the wrong things. Right? I knew I could drink Coke, but they told me about Crown and Coke, how they go together. I didn't know nothing about that. But it was my friends. And then when I was in an environment, in the club, you can't be in a club and don't have you something to drink. Everybody else is drinking in the club. <laughs> a, a, a Coke, yeah. Bad company. I should have been in FCA. I should have been in Bible study. But because of my friends, they influenced me to do the wrong thing. But oh, I had a woman of God. Can I preach right now? Oh, Lord, I had a woman of God. I wasn't like Samson. Okay, okay, I ain't going to preach that. And I found me a Lord. Woo! And he who finds a wife, finds a good thing, and finds favor. Oh. Can I preach that? I found <laughs> Delilah, Lord Jesus. Let's read this, church. Uh, Proverbs 1, verse 8, please. We have that on the screen. Hear, my son, your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching. For they are graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Rewind back to verse 8. Who is teaching the child on what to do and who not to hang out with? The parents. It's not the child coming home saying, I feel like he's my friend. We need to talk about Junior and Billy Bob and see the trends and, and, and how, how he, is, he is molding his character. Parents, notice this. 
When your child comes home acting different, you better think about the friends. When they come home not following what you have taught, you better think about the friends. We had to catch it with my son. He came home. He's a straight-A student. Came home with a B, a low B. And the B's not bad, but the B is not him. And when we talked to the teachers, we said, what's going on with our son? And the teacher said, you know what? He's hanging with some people. So we had some have a conversation. Say, son, who are your friends? I know you like them and all, but you can't hang with Junior. But this is the parents' instruction. I talked about sleepovers, parents. Um, anytime you let your children out of your home or out of, you need to know where your kids are going. Okay? And not only that, but you need to know the parents. You need to know them. Are they good people? Are they drinking in the home? Okay? Are they doing other stuff in the home? Right? Don't feel bad about this, but you need to know this. And you don't have to bring a resume over there, a parenting resume. All right, so where you work? How much money y'all make? Okay, let me see y'all, run y'all's credit. No. But over time, have some supervised visits with them. Okay? Be in the home with them. Watch how they carry their matter. Watch how the husband and wife treat each other. Okay? Before you start releasing your child. Amen? All right. Is this helpful, church? Amen. All right. So let's keep reading on. We're going to stay in this verse. But read verse 10. Okay? It says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Okay? I like what the parent is doing here. Okay? Because I told you, one extreme that we have as parents is, is we want to lock our kids up in our house. Right? We want to homeschool them, and, and I'm not against homeschool. If you want to do that, God bless you. Right? But some of the, I hear some of the parents, the reason why they home, because I don't want him to get next to, well, when he gets the job, he's going to get next to some crazy people. When he goes to college, especially if he goes to PV, no. <laughs> Pastor being petty. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, time out. Did I reach on your aisle over here? P okay, did I reach over y'all? What PV for? Lord Jesus. P oh, my PV. Who, uh, who you know? What's y'all say? You know. Whatever y'all say. <laughs> they call me Petty Pastor. I'm sorry. Petty Pastor. But they're going to end up being environments where they have to deal with difficult people. On your job, do you have difficult people? <laughs> do you have people that curse on your job? Do you have people that womanize on your job? Do you have sexist on your job? So we don't want to shield our kids to this environment. When they grow up, they're going to get invited to happy hour. They're going to get invited to do negative things. But I like how the mother and father are instructing them. They say, son, if sinners entice you, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't give in. Just say no. But look who's giving the instruction. It's the mother and father. Okay? So as your children come home and they make a bad decision because of a friend, say, listen, you need to stop hanging around those friends. But if someone tells you to do something, what do you say? No. Parents, you're going to get tired of saying this. Trust me. you get tired of saying this. But you have to say it over and over again. So listen, our parents, our, our job is to train up our children in the way that they what? Should go. So when they get old, they will not depart from it. So a lot of things. I had lunch with my mom uh, uh, Friday. Yeah, Friday. And here she is as a mother still giving me instruction of how I'm supposed to handle my character, how I'm supposed to handle my relationships. Who I'm I mean, this is great instruction. But I appreciate it now as an older man 
because I understand that she was doing what's best for me. Okay? So parents, understand, we have the vision. We know where our children should go. Is this helpful, church? All right. One thing I found, uh, my boys, they love watching a football life. Okay? They watch this over and over again. And they watch the story of Michael Vick. Okay? And I, it was a good teaching moment for them to talk about Michael Vick. Because Michael Vick, y'all all know, he was a great football player. We have never, ever seen a Michael Vick. He not only had the arms, but he had the legs. He could run. He could throw. He could move, right? And he had some success in his life and in his career. Signed a multi-million dollar contract with the Atlanta Falcons. But as we study the story of Michael Vick, we understood that Michael Vick could not separate his past from his present. God had called him to purpose, but he was stuck in his past. He was called to be great. And instead of hanging around greatness, he was hanging around the people that he had graduated from. Michael Vick, the, the, the story says that while Michael Vick should have watching, been watching film, he went, was driving home back to his home in Virginia. While he should have been watching film study, while he should have been working on his craft and developing a, a game plan, Michael Vick was hooking back up with his friends. He was called to purpose. He was called to be great. But because he did not divorce his past. Listen, church, this is a message for you. Listen, the people that you have dealt with in your past, they can't be the same people that are taking you to your destiny. God has called you up here, and a lot of times we'll have some sentimental friendships. Yes, I understand you, uh, we grew up together, and we, we found, but listen, God has called me here. And it's not that I don't love you, but I love God more than I love you. So church, in order to say yes to our purpose, we've got to say no to our past. So Michael Vick, we know the story, he ended up being caught in a dogfighting ring. Millions of dollars, he got caught dogfighting. What you doing dogfighting? You've got a million dollar salary. You bowling. And bro, you out dogfighting? Friends. Friends. We all know Michael Vick ended up getting his act together, right? Uh, he stayed in jail, he did his time, but when he came out, he was a different man. He started hanging around different people. And he started playing, he went to the Philadelphia Eagles, had a good career, signed another big contract. And he, was, he ended up going to the, to the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, and they showed a clip of him hanging with Mike Tomlin. And here's a changed perspective. This is what he, this is what he said, this is maturity. He saw the young boys, he's at a camp. He told Mike Town and said, if I could just get one of those young brothers, if I could just get one of those young men and pour into them and teach them the mistakes that I made, the pain that I went through, I'll be fulfilled in life. He's a changed man. There's a scripture that says in Proverbs 18, 24, if we can put that on the screen. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Parents, with our kids, we have to define what a friend is. We have to define what a true friend is. A true friend, if he really cares about you, He's not going to entice you to do the wrong thing. If he's your true friend, he's not going to leave you when you fall on tough times. If she's your true friend, she's not going to gossip about you to other people. If she's your true friend, 
But parents, that's one friendship that we really need to make sure our children know. Because I know a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's a friend that's been with me during my ups and my downs. I'm glad that he can be my savior, but he can also be my friend. I can call on him when I'm in trouble. I can call on him when I've messed up. I can call on him whenever the world has turned their backs on me. I can call on this friend. This friend is available to you. This friend is not going to judge you based on your skin tone. This friend is not going to judge you based on, on what you don't have. This friend, in fact, loved you when you were a mess. He loved you when no one else loved you. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, that Jesus died for our sins. While we were in our messed up state, while we were in the worst condition at all, this friend came and died for you. And he is available to you. He is available to your child. And your, friend, your child must know that, that whatever situation they end up, Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Yes, it may get rough. Yes, times may get tough, but this friend is a friend you need to have. He is a friend like no other friend. This friend, his name is Jesus. But not only that church is I close. Image is a place where you can develop friendships. You see, I, I understand the church hurt. And I put a post this morning and I'm going to speak to that. I understand that people in church may hurt you. Okay? Or that you may be in a situation where you are hurt in church. But understand how the enemy works with that hurt. Because what he does is he gets you home in a place of isolation instead of getting to you to church, a place that can heal you. It's a reason why you should not forsake the gathering of the saints. It's a reason why you need to be in church. It's a reason why you need to develop the right type of relationships with friends. Because this is a place where healing takes place. You need to be in a life group. You need to be serving. Your children need to be developing friends here. Because you know the parents. You can come to the birthday party, man. Churches that close friends can make you or break you. And we as parents, we need to be influencing our kids' friendships. They don't have the knowledge or the character because they haven't lived the life you live to decide who they should hang with. They don't know. But who is responsible for that? I am. The parents. So church, as I close, I want us to meditate on that. But I also want you to, if you don't know who Jesus is, there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He changed my life. He can change yours. You don't have to know it all, but he loves you. He cares for you. And that is the reason why Image Church is here. Amen? Every head bow and every eye closed. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, your word is true. Father, we believe everything that's in the gospel, in the scriptures, and we not only want to hear the word, we want to do it. Father, you know who you spoke to today. I pray, God, that this sermon transformed them, that they're able to have a new perspective on relationships and friendships, and that they can be better, be more whole. So, Father God, we love you. God, we praise you. We ask that you have your way in this service. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Every head bow, every eye closed. If, if that is you today and you want to know just a little bit more about Jesus, you don't have him as a friend. Uh, but he's available. You don't have to know it all. You don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't have to have all the doc doctoral or criteria. You just have to love and have a passion for Jesus. So if you want to know more about him, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand, slowly raise your hand or, or show me your head. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about Jesus is, okay? And if you don't feel comfortable in this environment, as a pastor, I want to make myself available to you to get to know Jesus better in your life. Amen? Let's be praying, church.